Okay, uh, good evening. So uh, maybe someone will uh, uh, come. So but I think we uh, start. So uh, welcome, uh, everyone. Uh, my name is Xin Ning Song. Uh, I'm a professor from Renmin University of China. And currently, uh, I'm based in Brussels. I uh, work for the uh, Confucianism Institute at uh, Free University of Brussels, uh, and also the uh, uh, Brussels Academy for China and European studies. Uh, especially the uh, basis, the uh, uh, Academy for China and European studies, uh, it is a university network. So between uh, Chinese universities and European universities. Uh, currently we have uh, three Chinese universities, uh, Renmin University of China, Fudan University, uh, and Sichuan University. So from uh, the uh, uh, European side, we have uh, Free University of Brussels and uh, University of Ghent. So now we have uh, uh, five universities that work together so, uh, for contemporary China studies and uh, European studies. Uh, so we are very happy to have this uh, event. Uh, it's co-sponsored by uh, Free University of Brussels, uh, the two institutes uh, within the university, uh, and also here. So it's, uh, CRIS, it's a uh, European uh, uh, postgraduate school uh, for international and development studies. Uh, so it's uh, very happy uh, to have this uh, event. Uh, the topic is on uh, China and uh, global governance, uh, especially after the uh, uh, G20 uh, in Hangzhou. Uh, so uh, people uh, talk uh, lots about uh, uh, what's the role uh, of China. Uh, in the global uh, governance, especially the uh, G20 uh, uh, system. Uh, so now we have uh, uh, three uh, speakers. Uh, we originally uh, arranged four speakers, uh, but unfortunately, Professor Zha Daojun from Peking University, uh, he couldn't come uh, due to the visa issue. So uh, he didn't got vi get the visa yesterday, he got the visa today, uh, so that he couldn't come. Uh, so we hope he will come maybe next month uh, for another event. Uh, then we have uh, uh, Professor Huang Weiping uh, from Renmin University of China. Uh, he's an economist. Uh, he's the former dean of uh, School of uh, Economics at Renmin University uh, and also the uh, co-director of the Center for European Studies uh, at Renmin University. Uh, so uh, uh, it's uh, from uh, 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 Professor Huang. And we have uh, Dr. Eric uh, Fels, uh, so I'm not sure it's the pronunciation. Uh, uh, Dr. Fels from uh, Universal Bonn, uh, Center for Global Studies. And he's also the uh, managing director uh, of the uh, uh, Global Shift, uh, Power Shift. Uh, it's a journal, or it's a, yeah, it's a serious book uh, published by uh, Spring. So he's the uh, managing director. Uh, so uh, 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 also we know uh, next G20 will be in Germany. So we have a Chinese, we have a German. Uh, then we have uh, 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 Professor David K uh, from this institute. Uh, so uh, we'll see the Chinese perspective, the uh, German perspective, and uh, so although you are. British, but you are here for many, many years, so as a European perspective. Uh, so then we have uh, 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 Dr. F uh, Duncan Freeman, uh, Senior uh, Research Associate at uh, BASIS, the Brussels Academy for China and European Studies, uh, is also a China expert uh, as the uh, discussant. So now we uh, start first the uh, presentation and then uh, later we'll have the debate. Uh, so first, I will invite uh, Dr. Eric Fels uh, as the first. Thank you very much. No, I don't need this. I, uh, yeah, thank you very much for the organizers for inviting me. Um, I just returned from Shanghai yesterday, so I'm a little bit tired, and I hope I don't screw this up language-wise. Um, 
My name is Enrico Fels. I'm a um, research fellow at Bonn University and I'm going to talk about Chi the uh, German perspective on China and my country uh, on global governance issues and of course I'm going to talk about the Hamburg summit next year. This is the outline of my presentation. I will first begin with a brief assessment of China's role in global governance. This is what Dr. Song asked me about. Um, then I will talk about Chi German Chinese cooperation in global governance. Where are the different perspectives? How do we approach the issues? And finally, of course, I will provide an outline, try to look a little bit into the crystal ball and see what will happen, uh, which topics will be relevant uh, next year. Let's start with China's role in global, global governance. Why should China engage in global governance at all? This is a very important question, and uh, it is an, uh, a question that is very easy to answer, particularly if we look at the uh, developments in wealth. This is a, um, a graphic that shows you how uh, the wealth distribution was at the end of the Cold War, and this is how it became a generation later in 2015. As you see, let me go back a slide, uh, the green bubble really increased quite a bit, and if you look at other indicators, you can see that China actually became the biggest economy if you measure it in purchasing power parity in the world, which is a very uh, interesting development because this is the first time in 130 years that this has happened. Um, uh, the, uh, the, um, uh, uh, Germany and its allies during the second, uh, First World War nor the Soviet Union and all its satellite states ever came close to economic development. If you include other indicators for measuring aggregated power, states' power, which I did in one of my books, you can see that China has been risen constantly since the end of the Cold War. China is now much, much stronger than it was 25 years ago. So it's very easy to answer this question, why should China engage in global governance? First, it is self-interest. China has hugely benefited from what can be called the liberal international order. And as my Bundeskanzler uh, from Merkel said, with economic strength comes greater responsibility. Secondly, there's a necessity for cooperation in a globalized world, because in a globalized world we face global problems. And uh, thirdly and finally, and this is an area I've been doing a lot of work on, um, a richer and more powerful China faces the um, danger of falling into the, into the Thucydides trap. As you know, Graham Ellison uh, came up with this term. Thucydides trap means that since uh, the year 1500, there have been 15 incidences where a rising great power met an established one, and in 12, in 12 out of these 15 instances, we had a major war. China has uh, been, uh, was very isolated in the 1960s. Uh, China has become increasingly engaged already during the 70s and 80s. And since the 1990s, it has taken off. Uh, it has become a signatory to many international treaties, member of important established and new formats like the WTO or the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. And it has uh, developed an own vision for global governance. And this is something that will become very important in a later part of my presentation. China seeks to develop a new type of international relations with win-win cooperation as the core, and it pushes for a form of global governance with prominent Chinese characteristics. So despite the fact that China has benefited very much from the international liberal order, it seeks to xenocize it, uh, add own qualities to it, and further develop the concept of um, global governance, which is a good thing. Um, China's approach to global governance uh, basically rests on six interrelated themes, and I've looked at the literature and uh, crossed, uh, crossed uh, different perspectives, um, and I came down to those six, but uh, Swain, uh, an author uh, uh, who's working for the Carnegie Foundation, uh, also formulated these six, six uh, different interrelated themes. And the first one is China seeks to strengthen values of justice, equality, freedom, and democracy in the global order. Basically what is, has been called the democratization of international affairs um, and tries to um, increase the effectiveness, effectiveness of international law and the United Nations system. Secondly, China seeks to reform, but not to overturn, a very important uh, issue, the system of global governance for both altering something that is perceived as being unjust and improper, uh, and as well as talk new global challenges, particularly, uh, particularly in the realm of economics. I will discuss this later. 
Uh, thirdly, China seeks to protect and advance the interest of developing nations. China, as you know, is the biggest and perhaps most successful developing nation and sees itself as a voice for the G77. Fourthly, uh, China seeks to ensure the principle of equality of sovereignty uh, as the bedrock of global governments. This means that they basically stick to a Westphalian system, a Westphalian understanding of international order, uh, which means territorial integrity, respect this, non-deference, uh, every nation has the right for its own social order and development path. A very different understanding than you often hear in Western discourses on global governance. The fifth one is uh, China seeks uh, to promote the principle of state sovereignty which must main be maintained also in new political areas, particularly the cyber realm. And finally, China seeks to promote deeper level of economic integration and uh, works for the maintenance of expansion of, open, of an open economic system and seeks to prevent uh, protectionism which we might see in the future as a Trump presidency becomes more likely. So this is basically what has been called selective multilateralism by David Chambon. China has a high interest in global economic governance. Uh, uh, it has an interest in preserving the, the um, let's say, uh, Westphalian state system. And there's a low, rather low uh, interest in economic global governance. Let's talk about the German-Chinese cooperation. Uh, Berlin and Beijing have both benefited very much from deeper economic integration ever since the fall of the Berlin Wall and they both seek to strengthen global economic governance. Both ho basically hold the same opinions on many, if not most, aspects of the current system of global economic governance. And there's a long history of um, Sino-German cooperation, particularly with regards to um, economic global governance. For instance, China was, uh, Germany was very supportive to China's entrance into the uh, World Trade Organization, into the IMF. Uh, Berlin also lobbied for, towards increasing the Chinese voter shares in those uh, forums. Um, it worked towards including the renminbi into the IMF currency basket with the special drawing rights. Um, uh, Germany is the largest shareholder um, outside of Asia. Uh, in the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank and so on and so forth. They both have the same position on structural reforms, innovations and investment instead of fiscal approaches towards creating more global growth. So this sounds all very nice. There has been a close international cooperation between both nations and I just learned in Shanghai that there are over 60 annual dialogue uh, mechanisms which is much more than we actually have with most of our Western friends. Um, uh, however, recently, as you have probably heard in the news, uh, uh, there has been a little bit of a dispute after our Vice Chancellor Gabriel <coughs> visited China and there have been political disputes over the unequal market access, it talks about a gap of reciprocity, um, and of course there also have been different uh, ideas and debates with regards to national sovereignty and the issue of non-interference, particularly um, with regards to responsibility to protect. And maybe it, despite this, uh, China is uh, one of 11 countries. Germany has what can be called Regierungskonsultation, government consultation mechanisms. Um, one of 11. We don't have that with the UK, we don't have that with the US. So this is actually quite a strong, strong indicator for good uh, relationships. However, despite these um, political and economic disputes, they also have, on a, on a more systemic level, different takes on the models of global governance, when it comes to governance actors, when it comes to governance approaches and governance values. I will provide a table on this in a minute. Basically, China strongly favors global economic um, governance, but hesitates to strengthen the global governance in other fields. Germany um, basically loves the Chinese approach with regards to global economic governance, but would like to push further in non-economic fields as well. There has been intense German-Chinese uh, uh, communication prior to the Hangzhou summit. As you know, the Troika format always involves the next uh, uh, presidency, and um, I believe this was partly uh, uh, the reason why there has been an extension of the topics during the Hangzhou uh, summit. So what do I mean with different government actors, uh, governance actors, governance approaches and governance values? This is a table based on Cao, Cao Zhen, um, who uh, distinguishes between different uh, levels of analysis. And uh, what you can basically take away is that 
Germany has a very high interest in integrating non-state actors, be they, uh, let's say, intergovernmental international organizations or be they non-governmental organizations. This is rather medium and moderately important, moderately important for China. Secondly, as I mentioned before, China is very much concerned about maintaining sovereignty. Due to our history as Germans, we are actually quite fond of creating new institutions that help to mitigate problems, um, address conflict, uh, and we are open for, for humanitarian intervention, as most other European states are. Um, and when you look at it at a philosophical level, you can actually see that Germany is following a quite Kantian approach to uh, global governance, uh, meaning that um, uh, uh, we, are, we are happy to, to um, constitutionalize the global world creating more international forests so that there's a rule of law everywhere that a, um, a union of republics is established, so to say, as Immanuel Kant did. While China um, very much um, pushes for the, for the continuing equality of nation states and for the right of own development. So non-interference is very much important. And this is, of course, driven by China's colonial experience, the century of humiliation having the feeling that you have to protect yourself. And China's, this is, China's not the only country having this impression. Most countries in the world actually have this. Um, yeah, and uh, of course, China's, Chinese are very much interested in realpolitik, which Germany obviously, obviously isn't. Uh, let's talk about the upcoming meeting. Uh, I'm running out of time, as you know. Uh, Germany will take over the G20 presidency in about two weeks, on the 1st of December. And in the mid of 2017, there will be the Hamburg summit. Uh, prior to that, of course, again, many uh, meetings um, with uh, ministers, with uh, uh, working groups. And uh, of course, she said uh, that China and Germany share all around, an all around strategic partnership and that they want to um, work together in order to ensure that the results and the ideas of the Hangzhou summit are also found in the Hamburg summit. And in the literature, uh, scholars describe this development that Germany is uh, following China. Uh, as the president of the G20 as a window of opportunity to further shape the path of the G20, intensify cooperation on a specific set of fields deemed very important by both Berlin and Beijing. So another uh, way how, how both countries can cooperate. And basically we can find three pillars if we look at the crystal balls that might probably be very important for the German presidency. Resilience, responsibility and sustainability. And as I'm running out of time, I will be... No, is it fine? Okay. Um, um, uh, I will quickly address all these things, or not all of them, maybe just a few of them. Uh, resilience, of course, as you know, Germany is very much concerned about debt, tricks to reduce unsustainable debt burdens, um, and this includes uh, sovereign and corporate debt. Both China and Germany share um, the, the concern about debt development. When it comes to fiscal policy, uh, Germany does not believe that fiscal stimuli can help to overcome the global financial crisis and create um, a new um, economic momentum. Um, I think Beijing also agrees to this. When it comes to financial regulation, both countries seek to implement and monitor financial regulations and uh, particularly Germany is concerned with stopping shadow banking and uh, as far as I could uh, identify from the German media, the Bundesbank will probably develop a structured framework to evaluate the results of financial regulations. So not only talking points, but we have to measure somehow. I'm excited uh, if this will take place. Talking about the second uh, pillar, of course, we have um, the Ag Agenda 2030 for sustainable development. The German presidency is likely initiating a system again to monitor progress on the G20 sustainable development goals. Um, we have the African Compact for Investment, especially in infrastructure. Uh, there will be a major African partnership conference in mid-2017. And as far as I know, it will be a few weeks earlier to the Hamburg summit. So the, the results and the discussions uh, within this conference will probably influence the discussions in, of the Hamburg summit as well. And of course, again, there are concerns about African levels of debt and the ability to um, get, out, get out of the debt cycles. Sustainability, um, well, uh, there might be an energy environment sustainability working group that tries to uh, you know, create uh, climate-related uh, disclosures, development of green bonds, uh, clean infrastructure investment, and, and so on and so forth. So basically, uh, link the German concern with environmental sustainability with global um, uh, economic sustainability. 
So as we can see, if we link Hangzhou and Hamburg, um, we can see that Hangzhou uh, aimed at an innovative, invigorated, interconnected and inclusive world economy, as she made sure in his welcome address um, to the uh, summit participants. And I basically like to, to point out three uh, links between both, uh, both, uh, both summit. The first one will be Germany's priority on investment and infrastructure supports. Um, there are um, uh, this is a reflection of Chinese efforts in establishing an invigorated and interconnected world economy. We have the uh, emphasis of Berlin on sustainable development, the African Compact and the Agenda 2030. This contributes, of course, to China's aim of an inclusive world economy that includes the low and least developed countries in global economic governance. And finally, um, the Sino-German Partnership on Innovation, which was founded in 2014, and the more recent innovation strategy that the uh, Federal Ministry of Education and Research uh, concluded with China in December last year, may serve as a model for an innovative world economy. So you can see how these things come together. Okay, I think I'm out of time. Thank you very much for your attention, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. So, okay, uh, our next speaker is uh, Huang Weiping from uh, Renmin University of China. Okay, I'm sitting here, okay. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and uh, I would like to say something about, you see, the G20 uh, in Hangzhou, because G20 is an economic kind of the forum. The first time I, I will, you see, give you the very, very, from the very beginning, the concept that G20, actually the forum, just dealing with uh, world economy kind of the things, not uh, overall kinds of the so-called global kind of governance, no. Just dealing with the world economy affairs, only this. So, uh, in the past, in 1998, because everybody knows at that time, uh, Asian financial crisis appeared, and then you see this kind of the <coughs> forum established. Uh, at that time, this forum is a minister level forum to discuss about how to deal with the short-term kind of the economic crisis, especially the financial crisis. In 2008, everybody knows the subprime crisis in USA appeared. And then, you see, to every country got the kind of influence uh, by that time. Then the first time in 2008, G20 summit uh, organized. But even, you see, this summit, also the forum to discuss, to deal with also the short-term kind of the economic crisis. So I would, you see, see, repeat again here that G20, not overall global governance, but only the economic kinds of the forum to dealing with the difficulties appeared in the world. So, the very interesting kind of thing. But for the global economic kind of governance, China always is criticized as a free rider or the Mr. No, so and so forth. That's because the China always against uh, some kinds of the suggestion by developed country, developed country in dealing with the world economic crisis. Why? Uh, because you see, the old kinds of the global economic governance based on everybody knows based on the principle of IMF. WTO and World Bank. Okay, so in this case, very interesting is all the concept of this old style kind of the global economic governance based on this kind of thing, but with the concept of the developed countries' economic theory and economic uh, policy practice. But sometimes this kind of the things cannot fit to the 
developing countries' reality. So, in the past, in, in my mind, in the last two decades, every kind of the methodology to deal with the world economic crisis only benefits to the developed country, but developing ones. Because these two kinds of the country with uh, quite different kind of features. In this case, you see, the methodology may be best fit to the developed country, but not might, might not fit to the developing countries. So this time, the G20 in Hangzhou uh, included some very brand new kinds of the thinking. The first, that means, you see, just right now, you see, the professor from Germany just gave us that including the so-called 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. That means what? That means the first time the developing countries principle included into this kind of so-called global economic governance. This is uh, one thing, that from the growth to development. Growth means, uh, you see, the wealth enlargement. But for development, that means the change of the structure, especially uh, economic and the social structure changed. So the first time, you see, bring this kind of development issue into the so-called glo uh, global economic governance. This is the first thing. Second, that means, you see, uh, Chinese make suggestion that, you see, we want to change this short-term kind of the methodology dealing with the economic crisis into a long-term of the development in the world. Uh, Right now, everybody knows, you see, after 2008 crisis in USA and then to all the world, recovery very slow. Recovery very slow. So the problem or issue, not only dealing with the short-term crisis, but it should deal with the long-term growth and the development issues in the world. These two kinds of issues are quite different. Third, this time, in Hangzhou, G20 bring a, another brand new into the global economic governance. That means inclusiveness. Inclusiveness. Uh, because, you see, as uh, in the past, you see, most of the, this kind of the methodology or policies just dealing with what happened in the developed countries, the economic Cycles, economic crisis, and economic issues. But this time, inclusiveness, that means what? That means we share kind of methodology dealing with uh, all the economies in the world if in the economic difficulties. And then we should share, you see, the fruit of the growth and the development for the world. <laughs> this is the third thing. The fourth thing, this, you see, G20 in Hangzhou brought a kind of another thing, means from the functional cooperation into the institutional cooperation. This time, you see, a very brand new kind of thing brought into this G20. That means not only the ministers of the uh, public finance or governor of the central bank, they, they would get together to discuss the world economy affairs. But this time, even, you see, the ministers of the trade, they meet together to discuss what should be, you see, the free trade in the future. These two four things, very brand new. That means, you see, first, development included into the global economic governance. And second, that means, you see, we stress on kind of the structural kind of the reform in the future. Third, that means inclusiveness brought into this kind of governance. And uh, last but not least, that means, you see, from the functional cooperation 
into institutional cooperation. This is very important for the future of this kind of the global economic governance. This is the first thing, you see, for this time in Hangzhou, we just discussed and also appeared in the communique in, uh, in the last kind of the document of this G20. Uh, I do believe in the next. China right now, you see, will play more important role in the global economic governance. Why? Because you see China now the second largest economy in the world, but not in the PPP methodology, but you see as a market candle value, okay? Uh, for PPP, I, I never you see, consider it's very important PPP methodology. Uh, I always use, you see, the market value, okay? So right now, China as a second largest economy in the world. In this case, China should play some role, you see, in the world economy. First, China should follow the rules of the world economy. You could find, you see, since China access to WTO, that means to show the world, China will follow, you see, the rules of the world economy. This kind of the <coughs> following the rule of world economy actually set by Mr. Deng Xiaoping, and she will follow that kind of the principle. I do believe that kind of very important for my country. Without open, without participate the world economy, without today's China's economic development. And also China right now, the largest one in the world trade, and the second one, second largest, you see, investors in the world. So maybe from this kind of point of view, China will play more important role in the future kind of the global economic governance. And uh, also, this time, China as the largest developing country, and uh, China brought many, many new partners into this G20 kind of the meetings. You could find, you see, such as the chairman of the ASEAN. You could find, you see, the chairman of the Southern African kind of organization. This time, yes, China brought many kinds of the new partners into this G20 that make G20 uh, could, you see, give us maybe in the future as a symbol of the world cooperation and the world, you see, development. Uh, thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, now we move to uh, Professor David Fouquet. Thank you very much. Um, I think it's an interesting um, conjuncture of transition between China, Germany, European uh, roles and organization of global governance institutions. It comes as we are experiencing a transition, if not a challenge, to some of these institutions. I think with the election in the United States, we are obviously coming to a new page, a new chapter, perhaps, in this kind of multilateral governance institutional mechanism. I use these terms somewhat um, loosely because I know that the G20 is not a treaty organization. It's more of an informal um, meeting mechanism. I, uh, in a way, we're, we're sort of uh, competing about who thought of it first. Uh, I recall that uh, in my experience as a journalist here about 35 years ago, 
I and a colleague were interviewing Jacques Delors, the president of the European Commission at that time, and he brought up the subject rather spontaneously that the world perhaps needed a new UN Security Council to deal with economic issues. And to me, that sounded like a logical uh, recommendation. And ever since then, I've thought that, yes, indeed, there should be a mechanism for global economic governance. And when the G20 format was created or established or renovated in a way in 2008 in Pittsburgh, I thought, well, this might be it. Now, with some hindsight, I don't think it is it. But it is perhaps a stepping stone, perhaps an effort to deal in a more systematic, coherent way with what is extremely complex uh, variables in the global economy. Um, I think it's not there yet, and it is facing even unexpected challenges. Will this kind of informal, multilateral system continue with a new leadership in the United States that's skeptical, if not antagonistic towards it? We'll have to wait and see, but I think there probably, or they, there could be less momentum, less dynamism in the project, in the mechanism, and in the um, outcomes. I said to a certain degree I was uh, a bit disappointed in the outcomes of the G G20 process as it has developed in the past few years. I think some colleagues have even analyzed the Hangzhou summit and said that in some ways some of the outcomes of the summit were even weaker in wording, in formulation, in expectations than the bilateral China-US economic dialogue, which produced stronger language, stronger commitment to certain areas, certain, uh, certain fields of activity. I think that's understandable Bilater at a bilateral uh, uh, discussion or dialogue, it's probably easier to come up with sharper language than in a dialogue or process that includes 20 or more uh, partners. I think there are, again, I think that in a way puts a challenge before the next organizers. Each one of them has their own agendas to bring to the table. Uh, and I think Germany probably is, has already assumed a, a new role, a new leadership role in the, Unite, in the European Union in the past decade, dealing with the recent financial crises, I think this will be an opportunity to assume an, another role, a new, a new identity in the world economic system. Will it live up to expectations? It's difficult to say under these challenges. What I also, another, uh, another point I would like to mention that the next, it was pointed out by one of our students who works at the Argentine Embassy that Argentina will have the next G20 meeting in 2018. So I think that's an interesting trio uh, from 
a major emerging economy, an established uh, economy to another perhaps less emerging. I don't want to disparage Argentina's role, but it, it has a different stature, so it will probably bring a different agenda to the process. Um, there are other challenges. I know that Already in Germany, there are plans for finance ministers meeting in Baden-Baden, I think. But there are other challenges. I've noticed that, that anti-globalization protesters have even been demonstrating in Germany, manifesting their disbelief, their concern, their opposition to this very process. And we have others who probably weren't out on the street, but who are evident, who have been active in political activity in our member countries. I'm talking about the, the nationalist, protectionist uh, movements in so many European countries. I think they're no fans of uh, G20 or multilateralism or free trade, obviously. They've demonstrated their concerns. So there are a lot of challenges uh, to what is really a, a sort of mandatory process at global economic governance. We really do need to address some of these issues. Protectionism, inclusiveness, equity in our economies, in the world global economy. And that's what conceivably the G20 should be tackling. There are also other issues beyond the purely traditional economic sphere that were mentioned. Climate change, um, the COP21 and the Paris Agreement are also under challenge. And it's a good time for China and Germany to assume the leadership, especially in that sector, because both seem to be, I have no doubts about Germany, China is a newcomer, a, new, a newly convinced participant in this process. And yet, in the last few days, it has shown itself to be very committed, very engaged, reminding the new US leadership that the public, the world, expects action. So I hope that uh, in the next meeting in Hamburg, which I hope to be there because I have close ties to Hamburg and in Argentina we will see a global govern economic governance process that works. Thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, thanks our three speakers. Uh, so uh, each from a, a little bit different uh, perspective. So then we all see uh, how uh, Duncan has uh, uh, your point of view So uh, as a discussion. Oh, thank you for inviting to be, me to be here. Um, uh, I would have to uh, preface this with a quite short notice. <laughs> So um, that's why, uh, since I had nothing really, no comments really prepared, I said I would be a discussant. That way, I can I can free ride on on the contributions of other people and not really make any real contribution. But um, as people accuse China of doing, they're not the only ones. But um, so um, so, but I think uh, you know, around this subjects that we have or the the title uh, focusing on the on g on g20 uh we've had three very interesting presentations which really um show that uh, hang, hanging off of this um coat hanger if you like um there are a lot of issues which not are not directly related to um uh the g20 itself but much more broadly to to global governance of which 
well, arguably the G20 is is part. And I, I think you know, the first um, presentation from Enrico really emphasized um, that obviously China sees this as being very important and uh, as he so clearly explained not necessarily for the same reasons as Europeans do but nevertheless um, China has a real interest in in global governance and has been a beneficiary of what we could call a liberal liberal international order um, the second speaker um, professor Huang really focused on the G20 and, and um, the, the Chinese. Sorry. It is on? Yes, and perhaps I'm not, I'm not using it um, effectively. Um, the China, China's role, particularly in the most recent G20 meeting in, in Hangzhou and um, the contribution of China to that process of the G20 um, and uh, how that potentially creates um, a contribution to future global economic growth, the sustainability of economic growth, which is um, the fundamental, to some degree, purpose of, um, of the G20. Um, and David, lastly, who gave a, a presentation, I think, which in some ways um, re refers to some of the challenges, not just of the G20, but um, uh, of um, more broadly global governance uh, that we face at the moment. And I think um, if I was to make any comment on the three presentations, I, I, I think I would focus particularly around that and around um, some of the issues which David referred to quite broadly, which were not really quite so focused on in, in the other two speak by the other two speakers, but um, related to um, the events uh, the, of of last week of the United uh, the election the presidential election in the United States, um, I it hope it so happened. I think well, three of us one way or another have just arrived or come from China. I was in China China last week um, uh, and um, it is quite clear I think from both a European and from a Chinese perspective um, that the uh, election in the United States does present um, some, some, some real challenges um, to domestic policies, perhaps, but also to the to the international system. Of course, a lot was is predicated on on what will actually happen when Mr. Trump becomes the the president. But nevertheless, during his campaign, he has made quite a lot of um, statements, um, commitments, if you like. Um, uh, to do things not just domestically but also um, uh, more widely um, externally, particularly in relation to the economy, but not only the economy, which do directly challenge the this the system that um, all major parties to have have benefit benefited, and so when, for instance, he talks about. Um, Possibly, although now maybe it's a little bit being walked back, but putting 45% um, tariffs on imports from China. This is not just um, a bilateral issue, or it doesn't just just um, affect the U.S. E economy. It's a it's a global um, is potentially a glo global problem. Or when he talks about um, withdrawing from the WTO, WTO, this is not just a um, a domestic issue it's a it's a global issue and when he talks about withdrawing from uh, the Paris agreement on on climate change it's once again a, a global issue um, and um, it's interesting or certainly from an academic point of view to note that um, what in many ways has been the the primary architect of the system that we're talking about um, is now talking about with 
effectively withdrawing that from that system. And so the challenge then is um, what, what happens to, to the other major parties in, in the system? What is their commitment to that system if the United States, if the primary architect is no longer there? Um, are the other member states, or the other, sorry, the other the members of that system, the participants in that system, able to sustain it? Are they willing to sustain it? Um, what is their interest and what, uh, what is their commitment to the values of, of, of the system? Um, and are they, for instance, able to, to work together to, to sustain the system? Or will they simply um, look at it in terms of what is their own um, narrow national interest? Um, so I think, um, you know, we do face some quite serious challenges to that global system. Part of them will come from the um, from the results of the the, uh, the election in the United States. Part of them will come from wider developments, because it's not only about the United States, it's about um, political developments in in Europe as well, and it's about political developments or in, in, in China as well, and China's commitment to, to that system. So, I mean, if I was to draw together any particular set of questions, and I, I certainly don't think I have the answers to those, to those questions, but I think uh, the first presentation showed a, a real commitment on the European side and on the German side and on the Chinese side to, that, to the continuation of that system, Depi despite serious differences between the two parties on a number of aspects, particularly ra around the economic um, uh, relationship between Germany and China or, the, or, or Europe and, and China. Um, but um, it will take um, a lot of work and a lot of commitment on, on the part of, the, of Germany, of the European Union, of, of China, um, other members of the system, and uh, we'll have to wait and see how far Mr. Trump really is serious about some of um, his campaign talk. Thank you. Okay, uh, thanks very much, uh, Duncan. So uh, it's an interesting uh, comments or the discussion. So now uh, we'll open the floor to uh, uh, discussion. So I think uh, we'll collect some questions uh, first and then it's, uh, so it's also a very brief uh, introduction of yourself. Please wait for the microphone. There should be a another one or so use this one. Yeah, okay, so uh, we can you do first. Oh. oh, there it is. Sorry. Yeah, please. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much for quite interesting uh, comments. <coughs> now, uh, I make it in one or two points. One is that we have had the G20 now. No, let's face it, you know, G20, 20 countries, but some are more equal than others. Right? <laughs> and it's more important what China and the United States and Europe are going to do with that framework. Now, they have in a talking club so far. I think it's time that they also institutionalize each other. I mean, take some steps to institutionalize uh, and to take some, you know, measures together. Now. Uh, amongst those me measures, I would mention two. Uh, one is has to do with climate change. Okay, I'm happy to read today that 300 multinationals in the United States have served notice to Mr. Trump, you know, that he should not forget that the United States are also polluting. Okay. The second field is that of international taxation. That's very important because there is so much uh, despair in the world, you know, or, or there is a, you know, about the fact that multinationals can avoid taxation. Uh, well, okay, and that's true. Uh, their action can be taken, and already quite a lot of steps are being taken within the OECD and have already shown some results. These are two fields where one could e uh, of almost fairly soon have the G20 that institutionalize their action. I leave it there, 
And uh, that uh, goes along the lines which uh, our colleague from China has been uh, devising here tonight. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Wolfgang Pape. I'm formerly from the Commission, now with SEPS, here, the Center for European Policy Studies. Uh, I would like to come back to uh, David's reference to Jacques Delors. I happened to be at the Salut de Prospective at the time, working for Jacques Delors directly, and actually it was based on a study which we did not to replace any Security Council whatsoever. The idea of the Economic Security Council was based on regions, and that's the importance here. It was not based on nations. It was the idea to bring together some kind of representative of all the nation, uh, regions. Sorry, so this is really a video. Thank you. Regions, I repeat, uh, in case of economic issues. And this was at the time more or less the idea to have the EU, at the time still the EC, uh, together with NAFTA, Mercosur, African Union, ASEAN, and the trilateral of China, Japan, and Korea wasn't really established, but this would have to be added now, in order to have some kind of economic governance at global level. And this brings me to the question to Dr. Fels here. You pointed out that one of the differences between Germany, I would say Europe, sorry to generalize Germany here, is to overcome the nation state. And as a former official of the European Union, I'm very much aware of the problems we had with the Westphalia system, which is focusing on the nation state. We are trying to overcome the nation state. We talk about member states, not nations anymore in Europe. Whereas in East Asia, it's just the contrary. I don't have to mention the island issues between Japan and China, ASEAN and China, and so on. We are in Europe seeing sovereignty as a relative term now. We have different levels of competences, and we have different attachment for this competence, what I call multi-level governance, from the local to the global. And when we talk about global governance, I feel personally, and I'm working on that now, we have to go beyond the, what we call multilater multilateral system to an omnilateral system. That means including all, omnibus, for and by all, and not only nations. The problem here is, and we have seen that in European history, that nations have been causes for wars since the Westphalia system was established in 1648, and we have to overcome that now. And we have to show the Asians, which were imposed with the idea of nations by the European empires back in colonial periods, and uh, avoiding this in Europe, and we have 70 years of peace here in Europe, we got the Nobel Peace Prize, and we have to tell now the rest of the world we have this idea of international law. Nation is still the focus. We have to overcome that. And here I want to point out this difference which you made. In real global governance, it cannot be only nations that are ruling us. And that's a basic problem for me. Thank you. Can I? Um, my name is Paul von Heen. Um, I'm an international lawyer here in Brussels. Um, I was very glad and happy about the comments of uh, David and um, Mr. Fouquet, I think. It is what I was missing at the first two presentations, talking about global governance at a time when we're really living in an age of deglobalization. It is not just America and Mr. Trump. It, has, it is Brexit, it is Germany, it is in all countries a deglobalization process going on. Germany, the Exxon um, incident or case and Mr. Gabriel's um, uh, performance or lack thereof, if you like, uh, in China show very, very clearly how the strongest economy in Europe is also part of the deglobalization process. And talking in this context about institutions, about something which is the past, the last G20 meeting, when, when that process already started, makes me a bit f feel a bit troubled that we are talking about something which is removed from the reality. Um, Trump and the American elections have certainly given 
this whole de uh, deglobalization process much more push, much more impetus, in a sense, much more confirmation, but we're in there. And for me, the issue is when I go to a conference like this one on talking about global governance, that this is the, should be the key issue, people thinking about what do we do. The last deglobalization we had was, I think, ended with the First World War. And then it took us another for, for a Second World War, and until in the midst of the last century, 70s or 80s, that we finally came, came out of that. Um, I'm not saying that we are now risking in this process where we are another world war, but we are entering into a period with huge uncertainty, and these are the issues, I think, of global governance which ought to be addressed. And to a little bit address your point, I was actually in that context a little bit disappointed by Mr. Feld's presentation focusing so much on Germany. Germany is an important country, but I would have preferred as a staunch European, that Germany is being, maybe it is a leader, which it probably will never do, of the EU, but it is the EU as a player within the G20 meeting, like, the, like America, and if, e, if Germany leads it, but it's not Germany's views as opposed to who? France, Belgium, Italy, Spain. I, do, I don't think you mean that, but that's in a sense how it came across, and I think in terms of the approach, we ought to have a different approach. Okay, uh, any other questions? Yes. So I think we've yes. all the questions. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm Lin and I come from China. So uh, I have a question about the climate change. So as we all know, uh, clim climate change has been a topic uh, or a central topic of the United Nations for, for a long time. But as, as I know, climate change, uh, this situation haven't changed uh, even right now. So. I know uh, most of the poor places choose the develop, develop, uh, development way, which is uh, if you want to develop first, you need to pollu pollute first. You need to be polluted first. So, um, for example, um, most of poor places uh, need to uh, absorb the investment, such as um, heavy industries and something like this. Um, from the global stage, I also know there is, there is a limitation of the volume of, uh, limitation volume of, of emission uh, with, with each country, but some, some countries can treat the, treat the rights or treat the index, so maybe there is, there is also a situation about this, I think it's also bad for the climate change. Um, uh, I know most of the developed countries put their um, industries or put their heavy industries in the developing countries. So I think for the developing countries, it's very hard to develop the, we call it third industry or service, in the, uh, service sector or service industry uh, at first. So all, uh, only, one only one way is to absorb the heavy industry and develop our economy first and then maybe use our high technology and then to develop, develop the uh, third, uh, third uh, service industry. I think this, this is the phenomenon, common phenomenon. So I just want to know what do you think about this phenomenon? How do we change this situation? So that's my question. Yes, um, thank you. I will make my question very brief. And uh, uh, one of the uh, most hot topics uh, in China regarding its economy is, uh, is downgoing economic growth in the recent uh, few years. And I want to uh, hear the opinions from the speakers. Uh, what are your opinions on the uh, role that G20 is play has been playing and it can play to deal with this kind of a challenge? As we see, uh, China is one of the biggest economy in the world, so it could be also kind of a global challenge. Yeah, thank you. Yes, uh, my question is, uh, as China is uh, 
uh, the first or the second largest economy in the world. So its downgoing economic growth is to be kind of taken as a global challenge. As G20 is a forum to tackle, uh, to tackle the uh, global economic uh, challenges, so what kind of role G20 has been playing in dealing with China's challenge also as a global challenge? So it sh a role it sh should play like that. Yeah, thank you. Hi, I am Fujin from Channel Daily. Actually, I have uh, three questions. Uh, the first question is about uh, uh, you know, climate change Paris Agreement. Uh, right now, we are quite uh, worried about the fate of uh, uh, Paris Agreement. Uh, the major factor is that uh, uh, Trump has uh, won the general election. Uh, uh, so. I want to ask the panelists, do you have uh, some kind of uh, scenario analysis? What should be the fate of uh, Paris Agreement? Uh, that's my quest first question. My, d my second question is also about, you know, uh, just now Professor Huang said that uh, World Bank is, uh, uh, you know, uh, the one of the component of the uh, old system, old, uh, you know, economic uh, uh, governance, uh, global governance, uh, the, uh, the old, uh, you know, uh, system, uh, global system. Uh, and this morning we have heard that uh, Trump is going to uh, uh, set up uh, another uh, infrastructure bank. We called, uh, also call it uh, as AIIB, but uh, this is American Infrastructure Investment Bank. Uh, and China, you know, has uh, you know has taken lead in setting up uh, AIIB, and then uh, maybe in the future, uh, you know, the uh, United States is going to set up another AIIB. So, what's the fate of a World Bank? I want to have your comment. My third question is that uh, when we talk about the global governance and also the you know outcomes for the upcoming. G20 summit uh, in Hamburg. We need to take care of uh, what happened, what uh, is hot between China and the EU now. That is the Article 15 of China's accession to into WTO. So how this, how China and the EU come in terms to this uh, Article 15, we, how this affect the you know, the outcome of G20 in Hamburg. Thank you. Okay, so I think uh, we have no more time, so then we'll give the uh, panelists, uh, each of you, uh, probably three minutes uh, to respond. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cheers. Uh, if I only have three minutes, I uh, limit myself to the questions that were directly addressed to me. Um, well, of course, I'm sorry if I uh, did not satisfy the demands, but I was asked to present on this topic with the exact outline, so that's why I didn't concentrate on the European Union, but rather provided a German perspective on the issue. And uh, actually, I think that there, if you look at the Annex 2 of the Hangzhou um, uh, Declaration, uh, a summit document, you can see that there are a lot of differences between the European nations. Um, when they when they address, for example, you know the measures they address, uh, 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 the measures they use in order to address fiscal stability or debt reduction and so on and so forth. So there are different perspectives on this, and this brings me to the second uh, uh, issue on the EU and the uh, European Union's attempt to overcome the nation state. I know that this has been going on, um, but I think what we what has been aptly described as a, a as an age of deglobalization uh, is a consequence of this. And um, I don't think that most people in Europe would actually subscribe to the idea that sovereignty is irrelevant now or should be irrelevant. If you look at the European Union polls, uh, Eurostat polls on this on these matters, uh, maybe it's relative. Uh, but uh, uh, what we see is the, this this anti-establishment populist backlash, backlash is a reason. Uh, one of the reasons is not only economic. If you look at Milanovic, the Elephant Curve, you can see quite clearly why the middle class and the lower socio-economic class 
uh, is uh, saying, well, we would like to benefit from globalization more. We also benefit, but we benefit less than the other uh, parts of society. But also we would like to get our identity back. And don't forget that this, the, the issue, and I I'm not embracing this, but I'm just pointing out that uh, Brexit was also about reclaiming the ability to control issues. Um, the same with the United States, taking your country back. This was the second theme after making America great. So I, don't, I wouldn't subscribe to the idea that uh, uh, the European Union, this is a success model for the European Union, uh, quite in contrast. Um, and I, I don't know how to address this, uh, both the concerns and the, the advantages that the European Union obviously provides, um, but uh, it doesn't help by just pointing to seven years of peace in Europe, because then I could easily say, well, look at NATO and what the NATO member states did. Of course, they are member states, but they are states doing this. And uh, from my point of view as a security school, I would actually say NATO is responsible for the peace, and the European Union was quite supportive in this endeavor. But the Americans got all these uh, European, uh, got the European kindergarten together at the table and uh, made sure that great power politics, uh, well, were reduced to American interests, kept the Germans down, the Russians out, and the Americans in. Um, so I'm at the fourth minute, and that's why I'm stopping, but I'm happy to engage uh, further after the discussion. <coughs> Likewise, I'll be selective, but uh, I think uh, the questions and comments were grouped around two main themes, economic issues, trade issues, and climate change, which I think is interesting because I consider all those uh, strategic issues. Uh, they don't often come up in that kind of definition because we think of strategic issues as nuclear and geopolitical and so on, but they are geopolitical. I think the comment about the breakdown of the, uh, the of globalization, I think was in the cards for a long time. I think I've been I've been talking about it in at audiences in in Europe and in China that at some point or another the leadership has to address the discontent that was evident uh, ten years ago when when uh, shoe workers in Portugal were burning the factory that deserted them to go to China. Uh, this has snowballed, magnified into what we're experiencing now. And I think part of it is also a natural process of concentrating economic uh, relationships around a region rather than at the same time as we have global relationships and value chains and production chains, there are also uh, more intimate, more closer economic relationships. You can't expect the small and medium enterprise or all of them to become global actors or global players. Their natural markets are in their country, in their region, the country next door. And that, I think that's part of a natural uh, pendulum swing in the, uh, in the global economy. I think just as we have uh, uh, political swings there are, and economic cycles, we have that kind of uh, back and forth. On, 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 well, one other thing that struck me in the last few days is extremely significant. Uh, Donald Trump talked about imposing a 45% tariff on Chinese exports. You know what the, uh, the European Commission did just a few days ago? Impose 45% tariffs on Chinese steel. On one category, in another category, it was over 80%. So, yeah, uh, there's an interesting comparison. I don't know where we go from here. Uh, climate change, I think, uh, it's not only a question of pollu who polluted first, who's responsible for most of the problem. It's a shared responsibility. I think one of the things we're seeing or we have seen in recent years, is that the biggest problems are now in China, the pollution, the air pollution, in New Delhi, 
The air pollution is toxic. It's dangerous. I was reading this morning in Tehran. Um, I'm not quite sure who can be blamed for those, but it's a global problem. And I think the multinational companies, the international community, as it's so described, has responded ever since more than 20 years, the first Rio de Janeiro summit on environmental issues and climate change. And I think it's been a growing awareness that it is a global problem. Now, if one of the parties wants to step out of it, we've experienced this before. The Kyoto Protocol was the first uh, global arrangement on dealing with climate change. And guess what? Washington didn't ratify the Kyoto Protocol. So we've been there before. We, we can cope. We have to cope. Uh, th those are the only two questions I'll deal with. <laughs> Me next? Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, all right. Well, yeah, I'll try and be as brief as possible. Um, Deglobalization, de de um, I think you know, we should be careful. Uh, Globalization itself is a somewhat vac well, vague term. Um, and deglobalization will probably be as equally vague as globalization. Um, but it's true that it certainly does um, present some challenges. And if you look at, for instance, trade statistics, even even prior to um, um, the election last week, um, global values of, of trade have been have been falling. And there's a lot of debate about whether this really represents deglobalization. Is it a cyclical or structural change? Um, but because of that, you know, it doesn't mean that the globalized trading system is going to disappear. And, 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 the, and globalization is much more complex, I would argue, than simply trade flows. You can you know, Investment flows, financial flows, you know, in simple economic terms, uh, services, uh, it's much more compl complex than, than that. Um, but I think quite clearly globalization as, a, as an idea um, uh, uh, faces serious challenges and um, a lot of those challenges are around the who benefits you know, who who really wins and who loses and and how we deal with those um uh, the, the winners and particularly uh, the, the the losers and there's been a fairly simplistic assumption um i think throughout the world um or certainly in, in the major players that um you know, things like trade free trade and and so on are are good and um somehow everybody's going to benefit from this and maybe in theory if you, you know the economics tell uh, models tell you that this is true maybe but in reality there are uh, there are winners and there are very big losers and uh, that is you know I, I think a fundamental question that needs to be needs to be addressed um uh, climate change um well i i the, the, the model which has been adopted um, in in Paris, I would argue, in some ways, is a very Chinese model rather than a, a European model. You know, the previous Kyoto pro Protocol um, uh, what, and what was tri tried to be sustained in in Copenhagen was a model where basically you had a, a set of rules, you had a global carbon budget and um, it was fixed and you ha everybody had to um, meet commitments to that that budget uh, the result was that everybody rather than committing themselves to um, policies to address climate change was more concerned about who, who, what size their particular budget was and, and saw it as a, a zero-sum game where there were winners and losers um, uh, the Paris agreement is more about an open-ended set of national commitments and in some ways it's really in my view about 
competitive industrial policy and how that addresses um, climate change and you know, the, the, that's the you know, China's way of addressing climate change is basically through uh, industrial policy. Um, whether it works or not, um, whether it re whether it saves us from uh, disastrous um, climate change at the moment, perhaps is certainly is certainly debatable. You know whether the commitments will save us uh, at the moment. I think everybody agrees that the current commitments won't. Um, but nevertheless, I, mean, I think we have to treat it as an open-ended starting point rather than as, as an, an end point. Um, uh, I'll, uh, for the questions from Fujing, nobody's answered the, his questions at the back. Uh, his questions from from the back. The Paris Agreement and Mr. Trump. Well, I think we don't know yet. I mean, that's the the simple the simple answer. We'll have to see when he actually becomes president and when he's being lobbied by industrial um, businesses, you know, business lobbies um, in, in the United States and particularly those in the, uh, in the renewable energy sector and so on. Maybe he's going to rethink um, whether renewable and the climate change is actually a Chinese plot to, to undermine uh, American in economic growth as he has, cl as he has claimed. Um, um, the World Bank and the new AIIB, well, I think, again, we'll have to wait and see. Is he really is he, is he looking to compete globally with the World Bank and with the Chinese AIIB, or is that going to be a, a domestic bank to, to, uh, to uh, address what a lot of people, and even he has argued, is um, the, the problems of lack of investment in, in the U.S. domestic infrastructure? Um, Article 15, well, um, let's not go too, too far there, but um, I, I, I will put it into a bigger picture. Um, um, uh, this issue has been very much the focus here in Brussels of discussion um, of the economic relationship um, between the EU and China. Um, since the beginning of this year. I'm not sure it's actually going to be really resolved next month, but nevertheless, I think it may be the point, or there may be a point where um, both the EU and China need perhaps to step back a little um, uh, from this single issue, which is part of the relationship and um, has become a, a significant um, political and um, policy issue and think about um, what is the wider um, relationship between the EU and China and also if the system is under, under challenge, um, um, then what is their commitment more widely to the system and how they um, deal with their bilateral relationship and also um, their um, uh, commitment more broadly to the WTO, but um, to the global economic governance and who benefits and who, who wins. Or, sorry, who loses and who wins. Uh. Okay. As for the <coughs> uh, financial reform, uh, this time you see in Hangzhou summit something discussion, uh, some discussed, uh, such as uh, IMF reform and the World Bank Group reform, SDR reform, quota reform, uh, everything discussed, and uh, also want to get very planted kind of sufficient financial resources to finance the development for the world. And also discuss about, you see, the financial network safety, the issues. So uh, with, with this time, you see, for the Hangzhou Summit, really, for this kind of reform in the finance field, uh, so many kind of the <coughs> uh, discussion. But if this the discussion would put into practice, it's not so easy, okay? And also for the taxation kind of things, the international taxation things also discussed in the Hangzhou summit. Uh, 
with the OECD code and finally they make decision. The first step is very important to get taxation kind of information exchange. Okay, this is from very beginning because for something very difficult to go further such as the e-commercial taxation issue. Yes, they discussed, but no any result because the U.S. against that and <laughs> We Chinese also, some Chinese also against that, such as Alibaba, you see. Uh, also, in this case, not so easy, but from the very beginning, the first thing first, that means taxation, kind of information exchange internationally. Okay. And for pollution issue, <coughs> uh, yes, it's very important, really. And uh, if you, you mention, you see, uh, you pay attention to this Hangzhou summit that President Xi Jinping twice mentioned the three figures. The first, 23%. Second, 15%. Third, 18%. That means what? That means, you see, for my country's 13th five-year plan, we got, you see, a kind of the so-called you have compulsory kind of the indicators with uh, this kind of dealing with uh, natural resources supply and also the climate kind of things. The 23%, that means within next five years, you see, for unit GDP, water consumption should be reduced 23%. And for unit GDP, the energy consumption should be reduced 15%. And also, CO2 emission should be reduced 18% within next five years. Okay? And also very interesting, for my country's 13th five-year plan, within five years, you see, we got 25 indicators, key indicators. Of these 25, 10, very brand new only deal with climate issues, such as the natural resources, such as, you see, CO2 emission, and also the water pollution, so on and so forth. Even soil pollution included into this very brand new 10 indicators. So you could find it's not so easy, but really, my country really do something, okay? Because within this world, USA and China, as two largest, you see, energy cons consumers and also CO2 emissioners. So in this case, you see, for the next five years, you could see China really want to deal with this kind of the serious issue. As for deglobalization, that means, you see, if you mean globalization only could get some benefit, it's a kind of story. If, you see, within the difficult time, everybody, every country in one boat. So, we have, you see, united together to deal with the difficulty. This is only could be called globalization. Globalization is not institutional ones. That means connectivity go further. So, in this case, if you're just dealing with that in the mentality of institutional one. In my mind, it's not, not true, you see. Integration, that means institutional one. But globalization, that means a tendency, not institutional one. So today, we just talk about connectivity. Uh, not only, you see, by this Hangzhou summit, but also by UN, by IMF, and World Bank. So, in this case, I do believe, you see, with, within so many kinds of uncertainty. <coughs> right now, every economy is in one boat. So we have, you see, worked together to de deal with this the difficulty and make the boat go further. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, I think I have uh, uh, additional uh, uh, comments. So, uh, 
uh, as the privilege of the chair. So uh, uh, some people talk about the uh, uh, economic slowdown. I think especially the Hangzhou uh, G20s in this kind of uh, period. So uh, lots of people talk about the uh, uh, economic slowdown of China and what the impact on the world economy. So those kind of things. Uh, but it seemed to me uh, so uh, we should not only look at the uh, percentage of growth. So we used to have more than 10, now it's uh, last year's uh, uh, 6.9, this year probably uh, 6.7, uh, next year maybe 6.5. Uh, but we still need also to look at the uh, pure increase of the uh, GDP per, uh, every year. So we know now China is as the uh, second largest economy. Uh, if PPP, we, 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 we are number one. Uh, so, uh, okay, so uh, even the market value, so uh, 11 trillion, what this means, 7%. Uh, 7%, I think Chinese also uh, say this, every year we create uh, one turkey. Uh, so that's the uh, pure increase, so it's about, it's more than uh, uh, 700 billion. So increase per year. So even next year, so uh, 6.5. So uh, because this year, Chinese economy will be 12 uh, trillion. So still the same. Uh, so it seems to me it's pretty good. Uh, so people argue about the, uh, yeah, someone said China should keep uh, no uh, less than 70%. So it's basically, I think it's domestic consideration. If too lower, it's, uh, the, it's not the problem for world economy, it's the problem for, internet, uh, for political stability within China. Uh, so that's a kind of thing. Uh, so uh, uh, how to look at this? Uh, how to deal with this? Uh, so I think it's a different kind of approach uh, to, to look at the uh, slowdown. So the Chinese say the official saying is new normal, but actually it's not new. It seems to me it's normal. It's not Xin, it's Changtai. So if uh, such a big scope of the economy, so slowdown is normal. Uh, so that's uh, my uh, 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 additional one. So, okay, so uh, because we have uh, run the time, so uh, 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 we'll stop here. Uh, we can continue the discussion because we have uh, reception afterwards. Uh, there's some drink. So uh, some wine, some uh, soft drink, so uh, I think it's uh, another side, so, so 10 left. There's something we can uh, continue to have our discussion for another uh, 30 minutes uh, or 40 minutes. So okay, so uh, thanks very much uh, for our three speakers and the uh, discussion. And also thanks very much for your uh, uh, participation. Thanks.